incredible methodological sophistication that we saw from consensus analysis to anthropometry to ethnographic interviewing. Um, very impressive for, uh, for a set of short-term projects. And I think it's, um, it's also worth noting how many collaborative and multi-centered projects there were in this group, which is um, um, indicative of the way science is moving in general, but maybe not as ambitious as a lot of people would, would, uh, would be for a study abroad project. And I congratulate all of you on, um, on, being, on, on being ambitious and, um, and achieving as a result. So um, we have some time now for questions from the audience. So I'd like to open it up for all of you. Yes, in the back. Um, uh, this is for Susie. I'm just curious if you think that um, an environment like that in Japan, perhaps in America, with our mental mind frame of always wanting to make money and always wanting more. So the question was about um, the mind frame in Japan and about, in comparison to ours, and wanting to make money and always do more, right? Well, thank you very much for asking that. Um, that actually, when I gave this presentation at my own college's colloquium, I had a big slide on that. Unfortunately, I had 20 minutes there, so I wasn't able to cover that here. But actually, that's already happening. When I was there, like the only thing I could think of was really strongly, this is going to be America in the next 10 years. Because of what's happening now with the rise of personal computing, and the like freedom of creativity, being able to proliferate and to produce, such as web comments. I imagine many of you read web comments. Um, that sort of thing is going to make the very proprietary model of producers and not consumers that sort of divide completely unfeasible in the next, I would say, five to ten years. And um, actually, what's happening right now in Chicago at C2E2, I see some people, uh, Chicago, Chicago Entertainment, no, Chicago something Entertainment Expo um, is completely just, well, I think there are some other more professional, but most of them are webcomic artists who are amateurs who have just been able to go and kind of develop this by themselves. So yes. It's definitely happening in America, and we can get beyond that one pie mentality. Yes? Um, yeah, I have a question for Kristen. I wanted to know uh, what your favorite food was when you were in Turkey, and then also if you found that there were any foods that were typically American that have been made more Turkish. Um, yeah, actually. Um, let, me, let me just repeat the question. So, what, uh, she wants to know what her favorite food was in Turkish and whether there are some Turkish foods that have been made more American. Or some American foods that have been made more Turkish. Okay, or American foods that have been made more Turkish. Okay. I would say that baklava was definitely my favorite food. It was just a great combination of pistachios and honey and filo dough. So I thought I could not get enough baklava when I was there. Um, and yes, actually, I talked, I did a whole research paper on this when I came back to America, and the globalization of McDonald's menus and Pizza Hut menus, they actually had Durham's at Burger King and Lamb Burgers at McDonald's, so they really did try to kind of go outside of the box to get more of a Turkish, more Turkish people going to eat there. And how about Turkish foods that have become American? Um, I guess I didn't really notice that as much. It was more just like American foods kind of trying to epitomize Turkish food culture. Yes. Uh, hi, this is for Jessica, Chloe, and Maggie. Um, I noticed that all three of you guys put down like the um, a phrase, Pierre la vida, and I was wondering what exactly it meant and how that came about. Okay, so what does Pure La Vida mean? Yeah, yeah. Uh, Pura Vida is a phrase in Costa Rica. It's kind of a national phrase, and it's definitely all over all the tourist kind of shirts and hats and everything. But it's also a phrase that my host mom would say to me, be like, oh, how's life going? Oh, Pura Vida, which just means pure life. And it's kind of the national mentality. And it just means sort of like. Relax, yeah. Things are good. Enjoy. Yeah. So. You can use it in a lot of contexts. Yeah, it's kind of about everything. It's just like an exclamation. <laughs> if people are in too big of a rush, people 
people are just like, we're gonna do that. Like, it's, you miss your bus, it's just like, that's, it's fine. <laughs> the Costa Ricans call themselves Ticos, and there's a phrase that's Tico time, which is usually like four hours after everything <laughs> that's planned. So, yeah. Did you have a follow-up? Uh, not follow-up, really. yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. The same group, I was just wondering, did you guys spend your entire, was it a semester that you were there? Mm -hmm. We spent about two months, a little over two months, doing the research, and then a month before and a month after, first developing the research in San Jose, the capital city, and then a month after collaborating and doing statistical analysis and writing up some lengthy papers. Okay. Did you did you plan the project at all before you left, or did all the planning take place in Costa Rica? <laughs> Um, all the planning took place once we were in Costa Rica. We kind of met and collaborated with our advisors. Um, but when we were actually conducting and collecting the research, we were all in our separate kind of areas and not, we all had separate host families and um, we're doing kind of our own thing. We have the same general guidelines, but we weren't just like living together. We were living with families. And, and had you done preliminary research in this area or had interest in this area before you went at all? Well, we had to put on our application sort of like, I need a microphone, can you guys hear me? <laughs> um, like what we, what we were interested in studying when we were there. And I think we all just put sort of generally public health or you know, something to do with health and children. And then Freddie was assigned to be our advisor because of that. And he sort of had in mind this project that the three of us sort of worked on together to develop it and come up with all the methodology. Um, sort of, the three of us and him developed that once we were all there. Yeah. And because we had three people, we had kind of a, we were all interested in this topic, it was kind of a unique opportunity to be able to combine forces and make a more powerful study. And so in collecting data from three separate locations in a rural area, you can learn a lot more than just one, you know, town because you can make more generalizations. Do you have anything else you want to add? Can you answer your question? Okay. Uh, this is also for you three. I was just wondering what the perception of obesity and being overweight is like in Costa Rica, if it compares to America, like kind of maybe like a shame factor, and how that might have affected your study in terms of who returned, you know, surveys, who refused to do it, and such. So the question was, how is obesity perceived in Costa Rica, and how did that affect the, the response rate of the study? I think uh, maybe not necessarily obesity, but being a little bit overweight is generally seen as sort of a positive thing. Um, I know exercising is also like kind of weird. Yeah, I know some <laughs> other people have said like when we would try to go on runs, our host family was just what you're running I, again, like yeah. two two times, and like, one you did that. <laughs> yeah, why are you doing this again? You did that once. Wait till next month. <laughs> <laughs> I had the opposite experience because. And we, so we had two different host families, and my rural host mom cooked with a, like usually a combination of oil and shortening and butter for every meal. So I gained a few pounds, obviously. <laughs> and when I went back to my San Jose host family after the rural homestay, my mom told me that I had gotten chubbier. And I was like, oh, I didn't know how to respond. I was like, oh, okay, I didn't, I didn't mean to. And she's like, no, it's a compliment. Like, you look so much better. You look great now. So I think that, uh, <laughs> I think that being, you know, sort of, that they're always encouraging you to eat, and they do cook with a lot of oil. So I th and I think just being a little bit overweight or a little bit, you know, I don't know. It wasn't there's just like anybody was bigger. I think there's a yeah, less stigma towards it. But I think people do realize that obesity is a problem, you know, once it gets beyond just like the and and we did just have some issues in schools. We, you know, one thing we didn't talk about in our discussion, but we did in our individual papers, um, was that sometimes kids that might have been more overweight or obese were less willing to do the study, and kids it was a completely voluntary study. So more in the high school where people were more self-conscious about their weight, um, you know, there were kids where their friends would be like, you should be in the study, like, you're large. And um, you know, like my host family all the time, I had a host sister who was, definitely overweight, and they'd be like, why don't you just study Mary? Mary's fat. And I'm like, because that's not the point of it. But they all, they thought it was like really funny, and it was less, to, you know, she would always just, you know, jokingly hit them and kind of move on. But, um, you know, I think it is important to realize that some people chose not to participate in the study, and perhaps that was one of the reasons surrounding that. Yes. 
Um, this is for really any of the research projects. How did you share your research with the, with the areas in which you conducted that research? So the question is, how did you share your results um, with the people who participated in the research? Who would like to respond? Go first. Do you guys do that? I didn't get the contact information of everybody from my study, but there are some people who I became pretty close with after interviewing them and talking about food for hours with them. So I emailed them my final paper for some of the students that I interviewed. Yeah, I also did that in the group that I went with. I actually, uh, because what I did was it was not, my first study abroad was through my school, but the second one, I got a grant. I just went and basically signed up for a summer program at a university, and then was able to kind of go from there to Comicat. And I actually was able to recruit a lot of different people just from around there to come. And so I was able to do so much more because of that. Like, I got someone to translate, someone to film, I had uh, people who were just helping me with the survey. It was really a collaboration, so I was able to share that with them. People who I met and really helped me on this. And I did get close with, um, actually, the man who volunteered for so long. I emailed him back and forth a little bit. It's just very interesting. And hopefully I want to go back and share my research at Comicat, so. Um, I, I don't, we had sort of planned a date with our advisor that we're, we were going to go back to San Carlos and present our research to sort of all the administrators and just because of timing things he ended up having something come up that day and then there were like two more days um, until we had to leave until our program was over but from our, what we understood from our um, sort of limited contact with him after we've been back is that he did take our information there and present it in some form and I think he gave some sort of a PowerPoint presentation or something like that. And obviously, since he also works in the public health sector, hopefully, um, we're hoping that our research was useful for them. Sir, would you like to? Yeah. Uh, we had to present our um, research to the Centaurus team, so to make sure that we didn't like misspeak to the public. And um, we actually had to update the Wikipedia page for Centaurus, um, so anything you read on that, I've coded and updated. Um, and then in Australia, we presented all our projects to our in front of our class for each presentation, for each project. Yes. Um, I have a question for Aisha. I know you mentioned that um, they changed the, the way in which they were testing people for TV, and you said that the people who were needing the test the most were getting them or something like that. Can you just elaborate more on that and then kind of tell me how were these people who needed the testing the most received it? So were they kind of just pulled from a group of people and then they were like, you need this the most, so we're going to test you or how did that? So the question is how did the people who needed the tests get those and how to elaborate on that? So um, from my understanding of it, of course, India is kind of unregulated in a lot of ways. But for the most part, when someone is brought into the program, mm -hmm. um, it's because they were recommended by a doctor or they're in some sort of public clinic and they have a really bad cough and they think, ooh, you know, could be TB. Mm -hmm. or, you know, you know somebody has TB. Like, we should just check you out. Um, and so then what happens is then they go to the program and the program diagnoses them. And the reason that this new diagnostic technique, um, this theater experiment also works so well, is because um, the people who are spreading bacteria to other people um, are the ones that are like really like have a lot of it in their sputum. Like if you have like you know one bacteria, meh, like <laughs> the chance that you're gonna spread it, like okay, whatever. And it is possible like um, nine of ten people who have TB have latent TB, so it's in their lungs, it's just sitting there, and they're not infectious. So those people don't need to be treated, and it's probably more harmful to just give them chemotherapy without you know them being really a serious public health threat. Mm -hmm. So taking the people who have like tons and tons of bacteria in their sputum and automatically like, putting them on treatment mm -hmm. and the correct treatment um, is, is really vital. Does that answer your question? Okay. Yes. 
I was showing, you showed a picture of a sign that said no spinning. Yeah. And is that part of their public education to get people to understand this is a bad thing and you're spreading disease? And do you think it's worth it? The question is um, about the no spinning signs. Yes. Yeah. Um, it, it's kind of about TV. It, it's something that I think is a bit newer um, in relation to their awareness of TV. It's also because it's really gross. <laughs> um, I don't know about the kind of uh, um, it is really popular in India to, to spit and that is like a sign of masculinity I guess and so men spit all over the street and they, they have this treat that I don't fully understand it, it's some sort of red beetle like thing that they chew and you bite on the street and you spit it and so there's like spit everywhere and if you have TV that's a really great way to give it to your friends so um, they, they're trying to decrease that um, and I don't really think it's that effective. <laughs> um, people in India have a really serious distrust of the government. Um, they've had a lot of uh, conflict with the government over the past uh, few decades. They're a newer country, 1947, to another independence. So it's going to be a process, definitely. Maybe. Um, I, when I stayed in Botswana, there were lots of bureaucratic holes we had to jump through. If you wanted to do certain types of research, like if it was at the university, you had to go through the university board, and like if you're doing something in the general public, you better go line up at that ministry and try to talk to them. So, if any of you had challenges or like experiences, could you talk about them? Yeah. <laughs> um, I, yeah. <laughs> India is a hard place to navigate basically all of the time. And unlike someone who might study in Europe and might speak the language, I really don't speak Marathi. And it was really hard sometimes to negotiate that. And that's part of the reason why I did my study, my independent study the way I did, um, because it involved a lot of English texts. Um, it involved talking to a lot of very educated people who have their PhDs and could communicate with me. Um, ideally, I would have really liked to have um, talked to people who were you know, sick and be able to interact with that. Um, but then, you know, the bureaucracy gets in the way, you have to special clearance to talk to those people, and then you have to speak Marathi to get the special clearance, and all of those things, like, uh, basically every aspect of the Um, Yeah, I think we had sort of that, like, a lack of, besides sort of, like, personal beliefs and teachers who didn't want to be involved, I think we had sort of, like, a lack of red tape in general. I mean, we would, we would go to schools, go introduce ourselves to the principal, and, and this was totally normal. It's not like we were breaking any taboos or any, you know, breaking any rules, but we would go in and say, this is our research, I'm from the study abroad program, can we work with your kids? We would be let in, we could talk to all the classrooms we wanted, we could take pictures of children, we were, you know, touching little kids to measure their abdominal circumferences, and it was, I think we had pretty remarkably no problems with that. Yeah, it definitely helped to have an advisor who was involved with the system and he did come with us to present to the um, superintendent of the all schools like Chloe said and we had a letter with a signature on it and as long as you held that up it was like all systems go and they're all the kids so that was really wonderful now that we had so much access but then the cooperation once we had the access of trying to have little kids handy back papers was a bit <laughs> And it was almost more on our part that we felt like we had conducted research in the past and thought this is kind of weird to be doing this human subject research and not have consent forms. And so we worked with our um, advisor. Originally, he was just like, "Yeah, you just go to schools and we'll get approval from one guy." And we we're like, "Well, what about you know seven-year-olds whose parents might not want us working with them?" And so um, I think it was kind of a mix of kind of Costa Rican standards and then the standards that we were used to of specific research standards in the U.S. and in our specific universities. Um, and it was definitely a collaboration. Yeah. I had a lot of problems with intellectual property patents. Um, because in Medicon Valley, it's all like, you don't want your next door neighbor knowing what drug you're about to discover. Um, so <laughs> that was a little bit of a challenge. And like, they were very strict of what they could tell us and what we could share and what we could publish. Um, and then in Australia, we had a lot of, well, there are a lot of national parks where there are no collection sites, um, which is a problem when you're studying plankton and you can't even take a plankton sample in a like national 
techno collection zone. So. <laughs> Yes, you. Yes. Uh, my question is for Sarah. You seem very passionate when you talked about your topic, and for me that was very inspiring because as a woman you're breaking barriers, like to even be inspired to do this, to be in science. So where does that passion come from and what interests you in ecology and stuff like that? So the question is where does Sarah's passion come from? <laughs> <laughs> I think a lot of it is still, I mean, I'll always be passionate about my travels and research, but I've only been back in the States for less than a month right now. Um, so I think a lot of it is still kind of seeping out and it's me trying to, a lot of you have expressed how it's really hard for you to relate to your friends and family of what you've done. And I don't just want to put it away and say like, this is something I did once, but to really have it be part of my life. and. And I've always been passionate about science, and I think it's really, my study in Brad helped me like really come to terms with the fact that like I love it, and it's okay to love it. And like, you know, like someone said like, you know, I'm a feminist, like they said like, I learned that it's okay to say I'm a feminist, and then like, I'm a scientist, and I love it, and I think like, the more you believe it, and the more you're okay with it, like, that's like your passion, and that's what fuels you. So, thanks, I hope I have somewhat answered it. <laughs> Anybody else who hasn't asked a question yet that would like to? Yes. I have a question for Kristen about um, the, the people you study were female, and so I was just curious if that had to do with access or if there was some kind of gender role that um, determined why you chose to just interview females about food rather than that. Um, yeah, I would say a lot of it was actually just my personal comfort approaching women in classes. Like, the majority of my classes actually had primarily women in them, and it was a little bit weird to go up to just a random man on campus and be like, hey, will you have this interview about food, and like, here's a like, questionnaire, she fill it out. Like, I felt very comfortable doing that with women on campus, especially because like, once I got into a core group of friends, they could kind of introduce me to their other friends, and I kind of just used the snowball effect from that to meet new people and interview them. And also, I thought that it was still a good representation because women are still involved mostly in the cooking and the food culture of Turkey. So I thought that it was still a good representation of what the actual culture is like. Yes. Um, this question is also for you relating to food in Turkey. Um, uh, Turkey is majority Islamic my understanding, and there are certain food requirements within the Islamic religion, so did you see that evidence in your survey of the people you talked to, and how did that affect their choices or perceptions of American food choices? So the question is whether there was any evidence of Islamic food prescriptions in the study, and, and how that affected their view of American food choices and food habits. Um, yeah, in my questionnaire, I actually had a question about pork and how much they liked it and how much Turkish or American they found it. And even though they all put it as American, some, I would say almost 20% actually liked pork. So even though Turkey is 99% Muslim, it's only about 50% 50, 50 practicing Muslim. So I think it did come out in a lot of the people had like a great dislike for pork or so that they never ate pork. But I think that it was actually pretty accepted for some people to be eating it. Though it was very, I had a hard time finding it when I was there. Like you could find bacon on some things, but that was about so I have the back. Yes. My question, um, my question is about how you now think about study abroad. My question is how you think about study abroad and how you would talk to other students about it. Because I was looking at um, the goals that you had written down here, and most of you didn't mention academic studies. It was to travel abroad, learn and be involved with a new culture. And I think that's usually what think, people think about with study abroad, but all of you clearly were doing research and interacting with people and getting new skills that really deepened the experience and, and took it to a way another level. And so I wonder how you talk to students at your home colleges about why study abroad, what do you get out of it?
Who wants to go first? Start down here. I don't know about other institutions, but at Carleton, study abroad is very recommended and strongly encouraged. And I think it's a lot about experiential learning, and you're really told that it's more outside the classroom. And while you still be, you will be learning a lot. It's more just circumstantial and like where you are. So I don't know. I I've talked to some of like the sophomores who are going to be applying to study abroad, and they're saying like. The amount you learn outside the classroom is truly invaluable, and like, you won't be able to replace it. It's just an experience, and go for it. Um, I think academically, it taught me kind of the importance of doing actual hands-on field research, because um, before that, a lot of it had taken place in the classroom. So I think more than anything, I've gone you know, wanting an academic experience, but really wanting to integrate that in the cult with the culture and while living with the family. Um, and I just kind of got, or had a really positive experience with that, and that's shaped further research that I've done and deciding to do like an honors project and really wanting to work with real people and conduct interviews over using a data set or something like that. Um, I think overall, just based on that, we didn't write, we wanted to do research in our um, responses for that question. I think research is kind of a means by which to achieve all the other things we wanted. It kind of forces you to go out into wherever you're studying abroad and really interact with people. And um, for our program, I was living in a town with no other American or English speaking person. And so um, to accomplish all the things I did list of wanting to experience new places and learn a new language. and go out of my comfort zone, those were achieved through the research that I was doing. I think something that I went through, I know everyone says be open-minded about your study abroad, but I think um, while I was, especially when I was in a really rural area, and we were spending a lot of hours inputting data onto our computers and just sort of being by ourselves and doing that, and since I had internet access, I was you know looking at my friends' pictures from abroad, and I had a lot of friends who studied abroad in, in Europe or in um, one of my best friends was in Argentina, and I found myself being like, oh, that looks so cool, and it's so beautiful, and you know, there's so much, there's just this different kind of environment that they're in, and sort of wondering if I had chosen the right program, and I think that, um, especially after sort of having some time to synthesize my program and think about how much I loved Costa Rica and I loved the people that I meet there, I don't, I don't regret choosing this program at all. I think that I just needed to give myself a chance to sort of think about what I wanted to get out of the experience and gear my research towards that, which we all did, and then just enjoy it for what it was. Um, so when I talk to other students, like thinking of going abroad, I usually tell them that um, it's, I mean, kind of, some it's kind of been said earlier, like it's to really enlighten your educational experience, and especially when you have things like an ISP, um, it really lets you go in depth with the topic within kind of a cultural context. Um, and for me, like understanding disease, like within another country, and, like what does that mean, you know? Um, and it, it's a really practical application of the things you learn in the classroom. And I think that's the most important part, especially you know if you're in a, you know, if you speak French and you go to Paris, you really get to learn how to use Parisian French or you know whatever it may be. Um, and you really get that experience in the classroom. Yeah, I really agree with that. Um, that you kind of know what I've done, seeing that you. I work for you, <laughs> but um, in general, I do really try to emphasize the fact that like, when you are there, you are experiencing something not just academically, but in the culture with these people that you couldn't get anywhere else. And for me, it was really a process. Like, I don't feel necessarily like I got it right the first time. I did make some really good friends. and. I did go out to the community, but I still, like, there was really this barrier I felt I couldn't get past, you know, bowing, and people are very polite, um, and I couldn't get past this, like, monolith of culture. And I only really ended up kind of being able to do that in the summer through the research, and um, I plan on going back again, and actually, like, staying in a host family, and then trying to really get beyond the the superficial things of culture to get into like individual people 
And I think that's something that I want to try to impart to other people when I'm working with them and advising for study abroad. Yeah, I would agree with everything everybody's been saying. And also just, I felt I had a lot of personal growth from studying abroad. Like, going to Istanbul, I didn't speak any Turkish. A lot of people there don't speak any English. So it was really a hard time for me at first to try and kind of get accustomed to miming everything and trying to use, like, sign language to get my points across. So I just think that it really showed me that I am able to get by in a situation where I really have no control and really don't know what's going on about half of the time. And also, I think that the research I did abroad helped open me up to a lot of social interactions that I otherwise wouldn't have had. I got to meet all of these students who I was interviewing, and once you start talking about food, people just love to go on and on, so I became very close with a lot of them. So I think that overall the experience was wonderful. <laughs> Liz, did you view him I, I <laughs> passed you over in favor. I'm very curious. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, I actually had a question for Sarah. Um, the first part was like, did you study abroad, like, in Denmark and in Australia? Um, were you in a university setting or like uh, on your own? Um, the first one is it's called DIS, so it's Danish Institute for Study Abroad, and it actually takes about 900 American students, so they're from all over the states. And so you're only with U.S. students, but you can take elective to take classes at Copenhagen University um, or a few other institutions in Denmark if you so choose. Um, but I had classes exclusively with uh, people from different institutions. And then um, my winter term, I was with only Carleton students. It was a Carleton um, ecology program. So yeah. there are 26 of us. Yes. Um, I just wanted to say this real quick. I really appreciate listening to you guys' stories because usually when you hear about research, it's like super boring. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like really interesting to see like that you guys did really cool things and you came out with really like life changing results and stuff like that. So all your stories are very very interesting. Um, and especially yours, like I really am not into like anime and Japanese and like seeing people do that, I don't understand it. But hearing your story, like I think it's kind of cool. So the next time I see someone reading a comic, and like, I think about the research that you've done. So. Thank you. Anyone else? Any Don, you had your hand up earlier. Do you <laughs> and if someone else has answered it already, right. people just say that. No. No. Okay. <laughs> studies of where that correlation lies, there's still a lot of debate, so we were kind of just seeing what information we could get and what it would look like, but we aren't really confident in That's that aspect yeah, yeah. of our data. So, yeah, because the older kids had no idea. I don't know. Because, <laughs> you know, a lot of times we would go in and give the surveys to high school students and just have them fill them out and then take their measurements right away. So they can, sometimes they would like text their mom, so we're just about out of time, but I did want to ask all of you, John Ottenhoff mentioned at the beginning that sometimes research is characterized by false starts and boredom, and um, we've just heard all the good parts and the, the, uh, the completion at the end. Were there moments when any of you felt really frustrated and um, like things may not work out the way you hope they had, and did, would anyone like to share a, a moment or two with that in the next minute or so? <laughs> <laughs> and tell us how you got past that. Um, well, as Maggie mentioned, one of our main constraints is really just getting to these different schools. And um, I mean, for example, one day I walked 
like really made an effort to go to this one school that I had gone to earlier in the week um, and distributed surveys and it was about an hour and a half walk there and so I was like I'm gonna get this school though it's important because it's a pretty rural area and I got there and just like 90% of the kids weren't at school that day. It was just like a really nice day and the kids had decided not to go to school. And so I had walked all the way there and maybe got like five or six surveys back. And so I think at times there were just, I don't know, I kind of had to regroup and be like, it's okay, but I just, I'm gonna spend like three hours walking by myself on this road where like, they don't, it wasn't that usual or normal for people to do that. So like tons, anybody who would pass like in a truck would be like, oh, why are you walking? Do you want to ride? Just constantly being like, no, I love walking. I don't want to hitchhike. <laughs> um, yeah, I was just ripping sweat. I had my like huge backpack carrying a scale and this like huge right angle and you know my lunch. My host mom like insisted on packing me a huge lunch every day, which I just didn't really want to carry it to be honest. But she was like very set that I needed this big lunch, and so. Um, it was kind of important to really keep the bigger picture in mind when on days like that. Anybody else? I think also just working with a data set like that. Like we, I definitely would come home and like just we have we interviewed like twenty five hundred kids, so we had to put that in like these enormous Excel sheets and just like. My host mom was like, what? Like, stop. <laughs> why are you, like, why are you do you keep writing numbers? And I was like, we have to do it. And then just kind of going about how did we want to analyze it and did it want, did we want it in age groups? And we just went through so many different, the statistical analysis was an adventure, to say the least. And I think something that really contracted that was that every day we were working with tons of kids. Yeah. Just, I mean, so kids are like so fun. It's a great way to learn another language, to have to speak with a million kids every day because we're trying to get them to like lift your shirt up so I can measure around your waist or like <laughs> on the scale, you know, things like that. So it was a lot of fun. We had a lot of, I was asked, uh, I think we were all asked at least once if we knew Justin Bieber. That was a common <laughs> question. <laughs> was a great friend of mine. <laughs> yeah, so it was always fun. Well, I may ask all of you now to come up to the front of the room so that we can get a range of our group picture.